Hello, Rob Vane here, and today we're going to be looking at the micro features of film sound. Now, what you might not realize is that in a movie, nearly all of the sound is actually replaced in post production. Yes, they do record sound on site or on location, especially the dialogue. But in many cases, this is not very good quality and has to be replaced later. It's especially true in films with very sophisticated sound, like action movies, for example, where the set may be extremely noisy. You've got explosions going off. You've got the director calling you know, instructions out to actors. It all has to be replaced later. If you're looking at a little indie movie where people are just sat around in a room talking, then more of the dialogue, for example, will end up being used in the final film. Now, there's different ways we can describe the sound in a film. These are some of the key terms you're going to need to be known how to use. Now, the first thing is sound can be diegetic. The term diegetic comes from the word diegesis. Diegesis means a world that is convincing and believable. So diegetic sound is sound that comes from the world of the story. Easiest way to identify diegetic sound is ask yourself, can the characters in the film hear it, or is it only the audience that can hear it? If the characters can hear it, it's diegetic. Non-diegetic sound is sound that's not coming from that story world. It's there purely for the audience, only the audience can hear it, the characters in the world can't. It's there to manipulate our emotions, to create rhythm and pace to help us to know what's going on. There is something called internal diegetic sound. That is usually used to refer to when we can hear a character's thoughts. The character can hear it, we can hear it, but nobody else in the film can. Sound can also be described as synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous sound is sound that matches what's happening on screen. If we can see somebody talking, we can hear their voice. That's diegetic. We see someone fire a gun, we hear a gunshot. That's diegetic. Asynchronous sound is where the sound doesn't match what's on screen. Now, that's not to say it's not diegetic. So, for example, we might have a sequence that's set in, I don't know, the countryside. We can hear wind rustling through the trees. We can't see the wind. Maybe we can hear birds tweeting in the trees. We can't see them, but we know it's coming from that world. We see somebody walking into a bar, we can hear music. Well, maybe that music's come from the jukebox. Okay, so we're talking about music that's coming from that world, but doesn't necessarily something we can see on screen. Now, we can look at sound as being parallel, or we can look at it as being contrapuntal. Parallel sound, or indeed music, is sound that matches the mood or the tone of the sequence. So, for the sake of argument, if we have got a battle sequence, we can hear machine guns and explosions and, you know, loud noises and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's parallel. It matches what we're seeing. Contrapuntal sound and music is where it doesn't match. Usually done very the opposite of what we'd expect. This is particularly true in music. I mean, think of that classic torture sequence from Reservoir Dogs where Mr. Blonde cuts the cop's ear off and this music we can hear is stuck in the middle with you by Steeler's Wheel. It's an upbeat, bouncy, happy kind of song that really doesn't match the horror of the sequence we're seeing. This is usually done to emphasise something for contrast. Now, the sound in films is heavily layered you're going to have hundreds or even thousands of different layers of sound in every sequence in a film obviously the louder the sound the more important it is dialogue usually being the most important but sound is a very very complicated part of film now we've got location sounds those are sounds that are as the, you know the name suggests recorded on location or on set um, usually the dialogue, maybe some atmosphere, atmosphere is background noise that's there to create a sense of place. Um, as you can see here, we've got a boom operator with a boom microphone that's used to record the dialogue from the actors. It'll only pick up exactly what's in front of it though, so it'll only pick up the dialogue. It won't pick up any background sounds. That'll have to be recorded separately. 
Dialogue is obviously the most important kind of sound in a movie because it tells the story, usually. Um, we call dialogue that specifically explains things to the audience exposition. So, you know, you get lots of this in science fiction movies. I mean, look at something like Star Trek or the Marvel movies, and you've got somebody actually stops the action and explains things to a character that's a substitute for the audience because the audience is out there thinking, what the hell does that mean? somebody has to explain it this is usually seen as very poor writing if you have to explain things to the audience using exposition it's usually very clunky um, there are more creative ways of putting it in a movie but sometimes you just have to do it because the film's complicated another kind of sound voiceover voiceover usually comes in the form of a narrator where a narrator is describing the events on screen um, sometimes in the sort of like a voice of God style narrator, so that would usually be like a storyteller. Someone is telling the story to us, they're not a character from that movie as such, they're just a narrator. Um, Ted, for example, Patrick Stewart does a narration in Ted, it's as if he's reading the story to us. Um, but sometimes it can be a character from the film narrating the story to us. Think something like The World of War of Wall Street. So they can be diegetic, in other words, they're coming from that world, usually a character from the film talking to us, or it can be non-diegetic in a Voice of God style. These, as you can see from this picture, will usually be recorded in a film studio in a recording booth. It's called a, it's called Automated Dialogue Replacement, or ADR. This is another thing where you actually have an actor replace their lines that were recorded on set because they weren't very good quality, um, and they will read over the top of it. Sound bridges. This is something that's very useful for editing. What a sound bridge does is it flows from one scene to the next. So what happens here is that the sound distracts the audience from the cut. It could be a sound effect, it could be a piece of music, but it links the two things together, makes the cut less noticeable, helps the film to flow. Atmospheres, atmospherics. These are background sounds. Another good word for a background is ambient. It's stuff that's here to help establish the diegetic world to create a sense of realism or believability. Um, one of the most basic sounds of ambience is what's called room tone or a buzz track, and that's just the sound of an empty room. Because even an empty room makes sound. I mean, you've got the air conditioning, you've got the hum of the radiators, you've got the you know, little new noise coming from outside. Um, Walla is gibberish babbling of people in the background, um, usually used for crowd noises. But they're there to create a sense of believability. So if you wanted a film that was set in a city, you might have the sound of police sirens, of pneumatic drills, of car horns, of people walking by. Another term, sound motif. Sound motif is a sound effect or a combination of sound effects that are associated with a particular character, a setting or a situation or an idea through the film. Um, so for example, a Perfect example of this is Darth Vader's breathing in Star Wars movies. That sound effect identifies that character. Um, you might have a particular sound that represents a location. Uh, it could be the wind blowing through the desert, creating a sense of desolation and loneliness. Those are sound motifs. Sound effects. Sound effects are specially recorded sound that goes with a particular thing that happens on screen. Um, as I said, you know, location sounds are often recorded on location, you know, like your background ambience, but sound effects are created specifically not for realism as such, but for effect. So you will often have sound effects that aren't actually the thing that they're supposed to be. Classic example of this is gunshots. The rule with gunshots is you usually go one louder. So if you want the sound of a pistol, you use the sound of a shotgun because it sounds more impressive. If you want the sound of a shotgun, you use the sound of a cannon because it sounds more impressive. It doesn't have to be convincing, it doesn't have to be real, it just has to be impressive. Um, sound effects can be sourced from libraries. BBC is famous for its sound effects library. You can get them on, you used to be able to get them on vinyl back in the old days. 
you know they will be on actually you know three and a half inch tape possibly in the old days as well nowadays they come on cd in fact the bbc have just released their entire sound effects library online for free so it's got like thousands upon thousands of sound effects you can just download as mp3s however they tend to be stock sounds they tend to be you know cliches we hear them all the time if you've got a bigger budget production you may produce your own sound effects you will send somebody out to go and record sounds now that could be production or location sound also known as direct sound it's recorded on set so, you know, you want the sound of an airplane taking off, you send some sound recorders off to an airport and get to record airplane sounds. Um, you want gun sounds for your movie, you'll just go out to a shooting range somewhere and record gun sounds. Wild sounds, asynchronous background sounds. Most sound engineers will have built up a big library of various sounds you know, waves crashing on a shore, the bubbling of a stream, bird noise. They'll have a huge library of this. Or again, you know, you might send them out to record specialist sounds. But quite a lot of the sounds are actually recorded in what's called a Foley stage. Foley artist, named after Jack Foley, who created this concept, will have a big room in a recording studio with loads of different junk and all sorts of different floor surfaces and their job is to recreate sound effects. Um, they're colloquially known as walkers because they do footsteps in movies. So as you can see from this picture here, we've got all sorts of different surfaces, gravel, sand, metal plating, you know, concrete, and they do all you know the footsteps. They will do the sound of you know clothing rustles, doors opening and shutting, pistols being cocked, kissing noises any kind of sound you need in the film the walkers or foley artists will create it using their imagination um there's some really great videos on this on the internet i will link you some youtube videos and then what else we got we've got music music is often overlooked in films but it's extremely important um, there's always been music in film, even in the silent era, because you would have a musician playing music in a cinema, on a piano or something, or even entire orchestras in some cases, um, while the movie was on. So basically, music is very important because it manipulates the audience's emotions. It tells us how and what to feel and when to feel it. It also helps to create flow and rhythm and pace. And with things like the sound bridges, it covers over the edits to help distract from that. So it helps to create continuity to hide the editing. Uh, music can be used to establish a character. So characters will have their own theme that identifies them. Um, obviously, films will have their own theme song you know, that identifies that film. Um, so theme song music identifies things, characters, places, you know, events... Um, but more than anything else, it establishes atmosphere and it helps to establish time and place. For example, pop music is brilliant for this. Pop music is very good for evoking a particular time and place. So, incidental music. Background music, basically. It's non-diegetic. It's not coming from that story world. Only the audience can hear it. It's for our benefit. It manipulates our emotions. It tells you when to be scared. It tells you when to be excited. It tells you when to be sad. It tells you when to laugh. And it works with the editing to create this rhythm, pace, and flow. Theme music identifies something. A character, a place, an idea. It's the film's signature title music. Think of the famous Star Wars music, or the Jaws music, or the Superman music. All of which were written by John Williams, who's one of the great geniuses of film scores. Um, really, you're not meant to notice this music. It works subliminally on you. I mean, sometimes... Think of the Darth Vader's Imperial March from Star Wars. It's an incredibly famous piece of music. It sticks in your head. But usually it's meant not to be noticed. A leitmotif is a kind of theme music that specifically identifies a particular character, place or idea. It is shared whenever they appear and it will repeat through the movie. Now they might adjust it, they might tweak it, they might use different instruments to play it, do it at different speeds, but... It's there to identify things, principally characters. 
Now, I've gone for that very quickly because I didn't want this video to last very long. There's far more examples of this available online. I'll send you some other links, but those are the basics you need to know. If you've got any questions, you know where to find me. See you next time.